A Christmas family vacation. That's, that's what we're doing. How many of you are traveling for Christmas? Where are the travelers? All three of you. Good to have you today. Okay. How many of you are staying home and folks are coming to your house? Where are the people that come, people are coming to your house? Look at that. All right. How many of y'all said, you're not traveling and you forbid anybody to come to your house for Christmas? Where are you all? Oh, okay, okay, I got you, got you. Well, what, whatever the case may be, you know, there's, if you're traveling, uh, there, are these, uh, there, there are these navigation apps that will help you get to where you got to go. And uh, some help you a little bit more than others, in my opinion. Cindy and I had to go to Tampa. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks ago now. How many of you know if you live in Lakeland and you're going to Tampa, it's like driving to Egypt? It's like, man, why go there, right? I mean, so, so anyway, uh, but, but anyway, so we're, 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 going, we're going to Tampa, and, um, and, and I, I, I pulled out an app that I use, that I use quite often. It's called, uh, called Waze. Yeah. Anybody use Waze? Yeah. Waze is awesome. Waze is awesome. Like, it, it will read and tell you, you know, if there's an accident, right? It tells you where the popo is. Yeah. Kind of tell you where it's at, right? Like, woo, woo, slow down, 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, just drive, amen, amen, just a little model driver, and just, you know, back. so anyway, I, we, we were going and, and just, just enjoying, enjoying life and had, had the app up, and I know my way to Tampa, but, you know, the, the, it's helped. I, by the way, I, the one thing I don't like about Waze is it makes me lie almost every time I use it. Waze, true Waze users know what I'm talking about. Because usually you start driving down the road and go, you know what, I'm going to use my app, and you start doing it, and then it asks you, are you a passenger? And some of y'all saying that you're the passenger when you're actually driving. Me too. So anyway, um, but, but I, so, so we're going to Tampa, and I got my Waze app up, and you, you the whole thing, and, and we're driving, and all of a sudden Waze is telling me to get off at this exit. And I'm like, Waze? I'm driving 80 uh, miles an hour, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm moving just fine, and, and it's all good. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just driving, and it's, uh, this is great. Why would I get off there when this is good? So I ignored ways and kept going until I got over top of the hill, and then I see all these red lights of, these, of this parking lot in the middle of I-4. And I'm like, now sitting in a parking lot for I-4, I couldn't see it on the other side of the hill when Waze is telling me, get off, get off, you need to get off right here, you need to get off right here. I'm like, oh, I got, I can see just fine. And I kept on going and now I'm sitting stuck because I ignored Waze. Eventually, I'm so glad that Waze has a biblical heart, a heart of restoration, a heart of a second chance because she said rerouting and she got me off at the next exit and then finally took me through back roads of Fanona Sasser that nobody should ever drive through. Nobody should ever go through this. I saw homes and people and stuff that I'm not even going to mention that's just all like, oh my God, this is in Florida. And it got me back on to I-4, thank God, and it got me there. And I made, I made it because I finally learned to listen to ways after I messed up. I, you know, we're all on a journey. Everybody in this room is on a journey with God. You're on a journey. God is taking you somewhere. He, you're, you're going somewhere. I know some of y'all, I got a flat tire. I'm on the side. Okay, well, God will help you change your tire and get going. But we're all, we're all on a journey. We're, we're headed somewhere. And, and along the way, uh, God has his ways of doing things in our life. And while we're journeying with God, God's ways tell us, sometimes to get off on an exit. But I'm looking at my life going, but my life looks just fine. And I see no reason to get off now. I know God's ways says to do this, but my ways says to do this. And so I'm just gonna keep on driving and ignore God's ways and do it my ways. But I get over the hill and then I realize I am stuck in a situation I did not see coming. Has anyone ever ignored God's word and found yourself in a pickle? Please raise your hand. That's everybody in the room. Okay, very good. Me too. Me too. I know what it is to try it my way. I did it my way. This is not a Sinatra moment. This is not your time. To, it's we've got to follow. But, but because we keep going, we run into parking lots. We hit delays in our life. And now there's setbacks. And if I'd have just done it God's ways, I wouldn't be stuck in this situation. And I'm waiting and wasting time and waiting and wasting time. But I'm so glad that just like ways with God, God's ways, he also gives a second chance. And he'll get you off at another exit. And he'll take you through some back roads, some things you never 
never thought you needed to see, but God obviously knows that in order to get around the obstacle that's trying to shut you down, I'll take you through some things and some places that you're going to have to trust me. You don't know these areas. You don't know these turns. You don't know these corners. You don't know these streets. But if you'll keep following me through the back roads, I'll take you through some country, but I'll get you back on course, and I will take you home if you'll just do it my way. Why are we so hard-headed? Why is it that we just keep ignoring God's way when we ought to know, I'm 51, I should have this figured out by now, that my ways don't work, but his ways do. Actually, that's what God's word says, is in Isaiah chapter 55, his ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts higher than mine. there's, There's a conflict that we run into there but we have to learn to trust God. Would you turn to three folk and tell them, we really need to trust God more. Just tell somebody, we really need to trust God more. There's a story in the Bible that I want to get into today that talks about a young lady who had a major encounter with having to trust God. If not careful, we will take this story, we'll wrap it in a nice packaging, put a bow on it, stick it under a tree, and make it so fabulized, like it's just a fabricated story, when the truth is, it's a real young girl having a real encounter with God that put her in a real crisis of her life, but she had to learn to trust the ways of God if she was actually going to experience the promise of God. We like the promise of God. We just struggle with the way that God gets us there. Got to trust Him. Let's read this story together. It comes out of the book of Luke, chapter 1, 26 through 38. Watch this. I'm going to read it out loud, but you can follow along. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth. I'll come back and explain that in a minute. A town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Keep going, please. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will, come, you will conceive and give birth to a son. You are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never, ever end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Will you read that, that phrase, 37? For no word of God will ever fail. Say it again. For no word from God will ever fail. Say it one more time. For no word from God will ever fail. Say it in Spanish. Verse 38, verse 38, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. This is the Christmas story. This is where we usually pick up, and we go running with this. And it's an amazing story, but I want to take you into this journey and point out three things that we can draw from it. If we're going to follow the ways of God, if we're going to trust the ways of God, we've got a picture in front of us as to a young girl who was encountered by God's GPS. If you'll follow me, I'll get you there. We can learn something from Mary's story. Let's look at it today. Number one, the first thing I want us to look at and realize in this story is that God is coming after you. God's coming after you. God is not sitting on his throne idle and just having everyone come to him, wave palm branches and throw grapes in his mouth. That is not the God that we serve. We We serve an active God. A God who is intimately, actively involved in our lives. He's not this stoic, set-apart, cosmic egotist that's just sitting up there saying, worship me, praise me. Worship and praise is all good, but he is a relational God who is connected to your life and my life, and he wants to do things in us and through us. And so in this capacity, when I tell you that, 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 that uh, God is coming after you, I want to show you what I'm talking about because before the passage that I just read to you where Gabriel shows up and starts talking to Mary, before he started talking to Mary, he was talking to a man named Zachariah about his wife whose name was Elizabeth. Yeah. 
Zechariah is in, serving in the temple in Jerusalem, and he's there making sacrifice and representing the nation of Israel to God, and, and all this is going on. It's an, it's an amazing time. I wish I had time to get into the full teaching. I don't, but, but all this is happening, and his wife Elizabeth, they've been trying to split a baby out for a long time, and they wouldn't have a no luck. I mean, they did everything. They went to Motel 6. He bought strawberries with chocolate on them, and they did everything, and there wasn't nothing happening, right? There wasn't nothing going on. Like, like the plumbing is not working, you understand? And so, uh, so all of a sudden, like, man, what do we do here? Like, this is not good. And an angel, Gabriel, shows up to Zechariah and said, listen, your wife, she's going to have a baby. Uh, uh, Zechariah is struggling with the whole idea. Like, you, you got to be kidding. Like, she's barren. We've been doing this for decades. No, she's going to have a baby. The, Gabriel shows up at the synagogue, at, at, at the place of worship in Jerusalem. And then six months later, I just read to you, we just, we just read right here, where now Gabriel shows up in Nazareth to talk to Mary. Now let me help you with Nazareth. Nazareth was like the armpit of the world over there at this season. Like it's, it was full of paganism. It was a big trade route. So you had all kinds of gods. You had all kinds of idol worship. You had everything going on in Nazareth. In fact, one of the prophets, Nathan, he said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It was just known how nasty, how bad it was. And isn't it interesting? that the, when the prophets, the people of the region, they said nothing good comes out of Nazareth, God sends his angel to Nazareth to a little girl named Mary and chooses her to birth his son. In other words, God sent his angel to the synagogue, a place of worship, holy place, and he also sent his angel to the slum, from the synagogue to the slum, and promises were still being made. In other words, God doesn't care about the reputation that you have in your past, where you are, or where you came from. God can use anybody who is open to saying, Lord, have your way in my life. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't have to get your past expunged. You don't have to make sure everyone forgets about who you used to be or all the junk because y'all know there is some history up in this place right here, right now. We all got some stuff in our past. Just look at me just like you act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Take your halo off, set your wings aside because ain't nobody buying it right now, right? We all got some stuff back there, but God's not consulting your past to determine your future. He's fully engaged in where you're going, not just where you've been, and he proves in this story he'll go from the synagogue to the slum but he'll use anybody who is ready to be used by him I love this I'm so grateful that he chooses the unchoosable to get his job done that's why the Bible says in John 15 he, Jesus said this you didn't choose me I hear people say well I finally found Jesus no you didn't he wasn't lost you didn't choose me Jesus said this I chose you I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. Look at this. Wait, wait, we got, don't just read it. You got to read it. I chose you. You didn't choose me. He's been after you. He's been after you as a child, as a teenager, as a young adult. He's been chasing you at work. He's using circumstances of your life to get your attention. He's raising folks up. He's bringing people in. He's moving people out. He's been so intimately involved in your life. You're crying over some people that left, and God said, I did that. He is, he's so connected and involved. He said, I chose you. Look at this. I appointed you. What the? He's had a job for you this entire time. He's got a place where he wants to position you and raise you up because he goes on to say, I appointed you to go, to go. That means I'm not staying where I am. I'm not stuck in my life. He wants to bring advance to my life to go and produce lasting fruit. That means success is coming out of my life. Not a flash in a pen, but lasting fruit. Something that's going to outlive me. God wants to do something with my life that is so big, it'll affect my culture. It'll affect my family. It'll affect my city. He wants to affect the world through something he's doing through me. But look at this. So that the Father will give you whatsoever you ask for. He said, I'm trying to give you a blank check and ask you to fill it in. What do you need from God? What do you need God to do? Fill it in. But watch this. He also goes to say, in Christ Jesus. 
so you don't think this about how good you are because we all know how jacked up you are. <laughs> we, we know you got issues. We know you think some crazy thoughts. He said, it's not about how good you are. It's about how good I am and what I'm doing in your life. So it's not based on what you can do. It's based on what he can do through you. You just got to let him get in. He's after you. He's after you. That Bible says Jesus was giving a, a, a parable. He said, the good shepherd, he left the 99 who were already found to go after the one. The, the one that was out there going crazy. Bah. Bah. You, you, you probably don't speak sheep very often. But, 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 and, 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 but here's, 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 Jesus looking back, just going all over the round. Here, here's what Jesus was saying back to the ah, He's yelling, send me your location, let's focus on, never mind. He's, Jesus is talking back, he's, he's after you. Act like it's not in your phone, that's okay. In other words, let me help you. To Jesus, you're never lost. You're just misplaced. You don't work good everywhere. You work good somewhere. There's things in our life that we misplace, that we think that are lost, but they're only misplaced. I was down at Lakeside Village a couple of weeks ago, and I saw a lady walking around the parking lot. And I'm just standing there because I had a good idea what she was doing. And another lady was standing over there, and she actually admitted her issue. I think I lost my car. And I'm like, lady, I wouldn't admit that out loud to anybody. You understand they're kind of big, and you were the one that left it there. She didn't lose her car. She misplaced it. But it wasn't gone. It just wasn't where she was looking. You see, your hope is not gone. It's just not in the place you're looking for it. You can't find it in a party. You won't find it in a relationship. You won't find it in a job, a career, a contract. It doesn't come that way. Where is my hope? His name is Jesus. Your, your, your joy is not gone forever. I know you used to have joy, and it was all good, but and, and I, where is it? And you're scrounging, and you think it's a party, a pill, a bottle, whatever I can find, but it's not going to be found in anything other than him. Restoration for your family, your kids coming home, that's not lost forever. It's, it's there. We just got to look back in the right place for it again, and that's what Jesus is saying. He said, get your eyes back on me. It's not in what you can come up with. It's not in how good you can be. I've always been your source. I've always been your answer. He would be an idiot to give you anything that would replace him in your life. He says, I'll leave deficits in your life just to remind you, you still need me in your life. If you come back to me, here's the blank check. Fill it in, whatever you need. I'm your answer. I'm your boy. I got you. That's exactly what God's Word is saying. And he's declaring this thing to Mary. Mary, it's not about you. I'm coming after you. I'm coming after you. Everything is going to be all right. Number two, the second thing we see about the ways of God, to follow the ways of God is God's not limited by your condition. He's not stuck. He's not ringing, I know, me too, glory. I feel the same. Hey, God, God, God is, God, God's not like popping pills wondering how to get through this thing. He's not on Prozac trying to figure out how to handle you. He's got this thing, it's okay. He, he, he's got this thing figured out. He's, he's not limited by your condition. Remember, Elizabeth was barren. She wasn't having no babies. She tried and failed, tried and failed, tried and failed. She didn't have the ability. Mary had the ability, but she didn't have the hookup going on, so she was unequipped. Whether you're unable or unequipped, God proved I can still do something in you that no one can get credit for except for me. Because now Elizabeth is going to have a baby. And he offered a baby to Mary. We see this whole thing going now, but, but watch, watch Mary's struggle because we have the same struggle. Luke chapter 1, verse 34, Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. Now, oh, there's, there's so much preaching in this verse here. Stay focused, God. Okay, I will. You see, Mary's struggle was not with what God said, but how it was going to happen. How can this happen? Why? 
because I am a virgin. Mary was so focused on who she was. Mary was focused on I am instead of the I am. She was focused on who I am and my limitations and my situation and my deficit. And I'm not Mary. She was so focused on her conditions, on her situation, she did not focus on the promise. Can I tell you something? There will be things that God wants to do in your life that you're just going to have to take by faith. You're not going to be able to explain it. And let me help you with something right here that's going to really just irritate the bunch of you in this room. And you watching online, you're really going to get jacked up because you're not even here. But here's what I want you to understand. Here's what's really going to irritate you. God will do some things that you can't wrap your mind around and you can't explain. But I kind of like that. Let me tell you why. Because if you understood how it was going to happen, it would no longer be faith. It would be your understanding. And if you, don't need, if you don't have faith, then you don't have a God big enough that you need to go into faith. In other words, God will do some things that are not going, he's not going to submit to your reason. You're going to have to upgrade to just trusting him because he's God and he's able. The moment you get understanding to prove why it happens is the moment it stops being God and it starts being you. But the moment you realize, I can't even explain what's going on. I don't have the ability. This is beyond my capacity. But God said it's going to happen. I just choose to trust what he said about my life have your way in my life God and at that moment it all changes it's about how big my God is not not how great I am does this make sense to anybody it's not about you it's about him get your eyes off your condition get your eyes off your limitation and get your eyes back on how amazing how great is our God that's who we're looking at that's who we're praising he's a game changer he supersedes your limitations he goes beyond people's opinion about you. He'll hyper, hyper extend your finances. He goes beyond it all. He, he'll break all the rules, your education and your degrees and your family, your last name, things you own, your career. He'll hyper climb the ladder where you can't even explain how you got to the top of where you are and say, it must have been God. That's the only way to describe what's happening in my life right now. We can't reduce God's promises to our intellect because the moment I can comprehend God is the moment he stops being great enough to be my God. It's going to take faith to get this thing through. That's why the word says, I I love this right here, Matthew chapter 19, Jesus talking to disciples. Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. He, he He chooses the impossible to accomplish the improbable. And so he'll take someone from a messed up home. But as you get older, all of a sudden, your home is so solid and so blessed, it doesn't even look like the home you came out of. Like that home put the funk in dysfunction, but now you got joy and laughter and peace in your house. How did that happen? It must be God because there was no example I was raised in to have that right there. Some of y'all, I was born on the wrong side of the tracks. You don't understand what I went through. But now that you're older, you're no longer, now you own the train station that's running up and down those tracks. You understand? God has a way of flipping the whole thing that only he can get credit for this thing. With God, it's possible. We've got to begin to make our God big and get off of how small we are. Get back to what the angel said. He said, you're favored, Mary. God wants, you to, God wants to use your life, and your condition is not a problem to God. Number three, and I'm done with this one. If we're going to stay on the ways and the journey of God, we're going to have to get around others who also said yes to his plan. You need the people sitting beside you right now. I know, I know, I know. They got an ugly sweater on right now, but you still need them in your life right now. Yes, you do. Listen, listen to what Luke chapter 1, 36, 37 says. Listen to this. This is the angel Gabriel talking to Mary. Watch this. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. Uh-oh. How do you explain that? For nothing is impossible with God. God had Gabriel use Elizabeth, who was Mary's cousin, use Elizabeth as a testimony that if I did it for Elizabeth, I can do it for you. We all need a testimony in our life. That's why when you come in here, 
You've been through some hell. Anybody been through some hell in your life? Okay, how about the folks who've been through some hell? Y'all been through that kind of, uh, some of y'all hell got four L's, some of y'all hell got 17 L's, right? I got some hell. I, I know, I got you, I got you. But when you stand in here and you begin to lift your hands and talk about, I will not fear the storm because I'm trusting my God. When you begin to sing these songs and you begin to worship God in spite of where you've been, in spite of where you've been through, in spite of the struggle, the battle, the things that have been said about you, they called you barren, they called you a, a, a failure, they said you would never succeed, you were always gonna struggle in this area, it was never gonna work out for you, they said these things about you, but then God had the audacity to get involved in your situation and now there's something growing in you that no one can understand. You can't explain the greatness. You just feel like something's moving, something's shaking. Here we go, here we go. You just know there's a party about to break out because God is at work in your life. Only God can do those things. But he said, I need a witness. I want a testimony to show Mary if I did it for her, I can do it for her. So is there anybody that's been delivered from drugs in this room? Just wave your hand at me. You just, you, you used to have to, right here, right here, right here. That means if you're struggling with with an addiction, look around. There's hands in here. If God did it for them, he can do it for you. Anybody come out of alcoholism where alcohol was owning your life? Right here, right here, right here, right here. If God did it for them, he can do it for you. Anybody struggle with poverty, but God's open doors and he's bringing you out of poverty now. Look at the hands, look at the hands. If you're struggling right now, if God did it for them, he can do it for you too. Get your eyes off of where you've been and get your eyes back on where you're going and realize that God is in the business of doing the unexplained with the improbable so he can get the glory for it. Elizabeth is with baby. Oh, and I love this last line. For nothing is impossible with God. I love this. Shout out to all my English teachers. Shout out to all my math teachers because they taught me in fractions and they taught me in English. But anytime you have in a word two negatives, the two negatives turn it into a positive. Y'all kind of quiet. You forgot your math up in here? Some are going, oh my God, I just pulled something in my brain. Y'all just come on back. It's all good. It's all good. Watch this, watch this, watch this. For no thing, negative one, is impossible, negative number two. If the two negatives delete each other out, then that means all things are totally possible. That means I've got you covered. That what the impossibility is in your life, God threw another negative on top of your impossibility just so he could reverse the whole thing and spit you out the other side and say, look what the Lord has done because you can't get credit for it because he is, he's taking away the negatives in your life. This is what he comes after. This is what he turns around in our lives. So we're done with this. Gabriel is talking he says, go see what God can do. Mary shows up to Elizabeth's house. Elizabeth is now walking around six months pregnant. Y'all, she's showing, and she's already feeling it. She was fabulous. She had on heels, too. She has some Tamika Thompson up inside her. That's all I got to say, Tamika. And then over here, you got Mary walking up inside the place. Mary knocks on the door. Elizabeth! No answer. Elizabeth! No answer. Well, Mary was one of those kinds of cousins where she just opened the door and let herself in. Y'all got those kind of cousins, they just walk up inside your house. Yeah, that's why you got to get bolt, like dead bolts. But anyway, yeah, but she just, she walked up and said, she goes, Elizabeth! The Bible says, Elizabeth's response, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, verse 41, when she heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. The word leaped in the Greek has a translation that means to come back to life. Some historians state that Elizabeth was six months pregnant, but she had not felt the baby moving and had considered that the baby had died. She was showing, but there was no movement. There was no evidence of life inside of her where she was just 
what's happening. Mary comes in the place. And when Mary gets in the place and calls out to Elizabeth, life is her. And the baby leaped, maybe leapt back to life on the inside. In other words, there are many people that will tell us, I've heard all my life, that Jesus' very first miracle was turning the water into wine at the party, at the wedding, which is a great miracle. But maybe, maybe because Mary is carrying the seed of Jesus on the inside of her, whenever the seed of Jesus encountered the seed of something with dead, a dead dream, a dead hope, a dead desire. When Jesus came in the room, it made babies start jumping inside the room because when he steps in the room, death has got to go. Do you understand? Whatever died has got to come back to life again, and now babies are jumping. I bet Elizabeth was so glad Mary came to visit that day, and that's why we come to the house of God. That's why we need each other in this room. The baby inside of you, the promise inside of you, the dream inside of you, what God's doing in you. we got to get together with other people who have dreams going on inside of them because sometimes we walk in and we feel like our dreams have died. It's not working. I feel like I've been abandoned. It's not turning out. But when you begin to hear someone else's story and you see somebody look at you and their eyes are full of joy and hope and life, something brings that baby back to life again. That's why we sing worship songs in here and we declare God's goodness. There's something about making him large that makes my issues small and my baby starts jumping again and you and I have got to feel and know there's evidence of God working in my life every day of my life I want to know he's there I want to know that he cares I want to know that he's working some things out for my good God is handling my life everything is going to be fine if I can keep my eyes on how great he is and how great I don't have to be it's about an amazing God with an amazing plan with my life I want you to know God's got this. God's got this. Well, Pastor, I feel like Mary because I, I don't understand how God's going to work it out. If you needed something, God would have put it in your life already. If you don't have it, you don't need it right now. If people exited your life, wave at them, but let them go. Don't you stop. Don't take the exit they took. Your ways are not their ways. Stay focused on where he's taking you. Sometimes you might have to drive alone for a minute. Sometimes when you hit a side road, I don't even know where I'm going. Oh, God, this is a scary. I know, just keep on driving. Follow ways. They'll tell you when to turn. Just, just stay on. It's going to be all right. Yeah, yeah. Just keep moving. Keep trusting. Keep believing. Number one, he's after you. Number two, your limitations are not his limitations. He's doing something in your life. He's taking you somewhere. He's got a plan to bless. He's got a plan to do things in you that you can't ever take credit for because he's God like that. Tell somebody, he's God, he's God, he's God, he's God, he's God, he's God. Number three, we get around people who also have a yes on the inside because what is in them rubs off on me. That's why it's important we're in life groups, serving, involved in church. It keeps your baby jumping. I want to ask you to stand to your feet if you would in this place. Come on. You're on a journey. It's coming with some twists and turns. He's going to take you off the main road and he'll take you down some back roads for a while. Just follow what he's doing. There's some things that made you cry. That God's saying, I got you. I know. I got you. I feel like I'm riding alone. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't get it, don't get it twisted. I'm, I'm right here with you. I, I got, I'm, I'm walking this thing out with you. But I'm in an area I've never been in before in my life. I know I'm taking you around a major obstacle. That would have delayed your life for so long, but at least you're still moving. Just keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. I'm getting you back on the main road in just a minute. It's going to be good. There's going to be familiar territory before long. But I need you to know, I'm doing this thing. You see, when Mary got pregnant, she wasn't allowed to stay in Nazareth to have that baby. Now that you've got the promise, I'm going to send you somewhere, advance your life, so you can birth this thing in you. God's made a promise to you, but now he wants to advance your life to see that thing happen. God's got a plan. Bow your heads if you would. Father, thank you today that you're working all things together for our good. You've not dropped us, you've not forgotten us, but the truth is, in fact, you know where we are and you're coming after us. We're not lost. We're just misplaced. 
God, today we're saying, come pick us up again. If I've gotten off on a side road or if I'm sitting stuck, I, I'm asking you, God, that, that you would just reroute me and get me back on course again. I give you me, I give you my heart, my mind, my life, all that I am, all that I'm not, especially all that I'm not. Take all of that and do something with this, God, something that only you can get the credit and the glory for. I give you me today. Forgive me, change me, rework me. Do something in me that only you can get the credit for. If you're in this room and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you've never asked him into your heart and your life, I'm encouraging you right now, just say, God, come into my life. I, I, I'm stuck on this road and I need you to get me around the obstacles. I, I need you to, to change. I need you to take my past away, just cleanse all that mess. Give me a fresh start. I need you as my Lord, as my Savior. I give you me. I'm not good enough to live the life that I want. I need your, I need your goodness. I need your peace. I need your joy. I need your rest. I need your forgiveness. Come into my heart, come into my life. A simple prayer like that will change everything. It'll change everything. For those of you in this room that are struggling right now, you're wondering if God even knows, if God even cares, I'm saying yes, he does, and he's by your side right now. He didn't drop you, he didn't walk away. He's right there, and he's picking you up, and he's taking you back, he's getting you back on course to get you back on that road again. Everything's gonna be all right, but I dare you to pray a 15-second prayer of Lord, have your way in my life. Lord, do something in my life that I can't get the credit for. Take me places that I can never get on my own. Do something above my pay grade. Do something beyond my education. Do something my family will never believe, God, but I'll give you praise and thanks for it. God. Take my life. I choose to follow your ways. I choose to follow your plan. I choose to follow your path. Today, God, we give you us, and we ask you, God, to get the maximum glory out of our lives as we just trust and depend on you. We don't understand how it's going to happen, but, God, we get back to just what you said, and what you said is it's going to be all right, and your plan will happen. So, God, we trust you today. Let there be a performance of everything you've spoken to us. I give you thanks for it today in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. If you receive that today, would you put those hands together?